So with that said, Jim, you want to walk us through? Sure. I think we walked through this once before. But just, just quickly so that we um, queue it up for people. Sure. Yep. Okay. So um, statement of purpose uh, to allow the commission uh, to allocate premium and out-of-pocket responsibilities between employers and employees based on the ability of the employee to pay these expenses. Uh, to permit an arbitrator uh, resolving a dispute for the commission for a latitude in fashioning a resolution, and to establish a process for the commission to request and receive information necessary for the negotiations. So, uh, section one on page two um, makes a change in the release time as a new G. Let's read. <coughs> read. Okay. A school district that employs a member of the commission who represents school employees shall grant the commission uh, member time off as necessary for the member to attend the meetings of the commission. And then uh, section two uh, in the duties of the commission, uh, page three, uh, line six, talking about the premium responsibility. It says the premium responsibility percentages for each plan tier uh, that reads, may differ among participating employees to reflect an employee's ability to pay based on the amount of the employee's salary. And then likewise, on uh, line 12 of the team, we're talking about our pocket expenses. So it says the amount of uh, school employees' our pocket expenses for which the school employer and the school employee shall be responsible. Um, which may take into account the employee's ability to pay based upon the amount of the employee's salary. Same sort of thing. And then lastly, in this in the next page, uh, we struck out the language at the very top of has read the school employers and school employees responsibility for our pocket expenses for each plan tier should be the same. So that's not sure, sure anymore. Section three deals with negotiation. Um, and it adds language that says, on or before November, November 1 of the year prior to commencement of bargaining, the commission shall request from the parties, uh, from the parties, the negotiation data and information that it anticipates needing for the negotiation in a common format. <clears throat> and on or before February 1 of the year of bargaining, I shall submit to the commission the information requested. And then section four deals with dispute resolution. It changes the standard by which the arbitrator makes a decision. Line six means the arbitrator or arbitrators shall select one of the last best offers in its entirety without amendment. Next says new language. Comma provided, however, that if the arbitrator or arbitrators determine that the last best offer submitted by both parties are unreasonable and likely to produce undesirable results or to have a long-lasting negative impact on the parties' collective bargaining relationship, then the arbitrator or arbitrators may either A, select the recommendations made by the fact finder uh, in their entirety, B, uh, select them on the following on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, one, the last best offer of the reps of the school employees, and two, the last best offer of reps of the school employers. Jim, just to stop you quickly on line nine. Yep. Um, unreasonable and likely to produce undesirable results. Um, I, that makes a little more intuitive sense. To have a long-lasting negative impact on the party's collective bargaining relationship. I'm, I'm just thinking, I've almost never seen a collective bargaining situation where both sides weren't predicting that if the other side doesn't go with this, it's, it's really going to destroy our relationship. I mean, that kind of rhetoric is very common at the, at the end. <coughs> so it seems like in almost any situation, that phrasing could be invoked if the um, arbitrator wanted to. Um, is there a more specific reading of that that I'm, is it a term of art somehow? I'm not sure about that. This language, I believe, is lifted from the, either the municipal statute for liberal relations or the state employees 
to this standard, I think, is, is in law already. Okay. Uh, but I have to check with Damien on that. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, and also if, um, if you would query Damien on to what, it, to what extent that, um, or we could have him come in and testify, in his experience, of those two triggers, um, how, how often is the second one invoked as opposed to the first? Yeah. Because, um, like I say, it's 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 so common. It's almost you you remember the times when that wasn't the case when people weren't saying it was destroying the right yeah. fabric of the relationship. Yeah. Okay. It's, keep going. Okay. Lastly, section five duties of school employers. Um, it adds a duty uh, by nine uh, to provide the commission with timely information as requested by the commission in the fulfillment of its duties. Uh, I'm just a quick question for NEA. Um, Colin, wasn't there uh, a commonly agreed upon switch to the timeline that both parties were behind? <coughs> Yes. Uh, am I remembering that right? You're referring to um, the July 1st versus yes. the January 1st to its own lines with IRS rules relating to yes. HSA yes. Correct. Correct. Um, I don't see that language here. Um, since there was agreement and it was in part of the arbitrator's decision, regardless of which proposal okay. the arbitrator so decided. No need to make a statutory yeah. fix. Okay, good. That was our belief. All right. Any other questions for Jim on the draft? Thank you, Jim. Um, Mr. O'Dell, yeah. please join us. Um, so as I said, this, this draft was um, produced with a good deal of input from NEA. So you're first on the list to respond to it. Um, the other thing is I want to make it clear that the original legislation was produced with uh, a plan from Nicole Mace and then the NEA's plan, and we put them together. So if you have language uh, suggested from uh, school boards or from other parties, feel free to offer that to us at, at some point. So we're not, we're not exclusively dealing with the language that's here, at least theoretically. Perfect. And so what's in the document actually is a bit detailed and does offer some language. So I think it might make sense to just um, read through it if that's okay please. with you and uh, if you have questions please let me know um, for starters uh, thank you very much for letting me come today and, and testify with you my name is Neil Odell I'm the president of the Vermont School Boards Association Board of Directors um, before I share with you the board's position on S226 I'd like to start with our organization's mission and vision uh, the vision uh, the vision the Vermont School Boards Association envisions a state where every student has access to and is engaged in a world-class education where local boards provide student-focused oversight of education systems and where educators, families, and communities are engaged partners, ensuring that the futures of all Vermont children are driven by their aspirations, <coughs> not bound by their circumstances. Our mission, the VSDA works to achieve our vision for public education by supporting local and supervisory union boards to be effective trustees for their communities and by providing a strong collective voice toward enhancing the cause of public education in Vermont. Um, just by way of uh, a little bit of background at the SBA, we have a 24-member board of directors. I think you saw most of them a couple weeks ago. Um, president, immediate past president, and then 22 regional representatives. Uh, two representatives are elected by school board members from each of 11 regions. Uh, the VSBA is governed by bylaws, resolutions, and policies. And in the absence of a re resolution on a particular topic, the VSBA board provides guidance to the VSBA staff. Uh, Act 11 required the VSBA to appoint five representatives of school employers to the Commission on Public School Employee Health Benefits, the employer commissioners. The employer commissioners provided testimony to the Senate Ed Committee, this committee on January 8th, 2020, through their chief negotiator, Joe McNeil who reported on suggested modifications to the statewide bargaining process. Um, the items that you'll see in here are probably uh, closely aligned um, with what Joe had presented earlier. Um, uh, first off, concerns about implications of the arbitrator's decision. 
So for the past five years, school boards have been working to bring school employees' health benefits in line with those that are recognizable by other Vermonters. The arbitrator's decision in statewide bargaining reverses that progress and essentially recreates the plan school employees had in the past, uh, causing some serious cost considerations. Most school employees are better off under this award than in 2017. Compared to health care costs that school employees had under the VHT plan, they now have lower premium costs, lower out-of-pocket costs, no more co-pays, no more first dollar out-of-pocket costs and deductible amounts that have been held level since 2018, and more plan options available. Uh, the parent-child plan option is now available. So these are our requested additions to S226. I, before you leave, yep, that, I, would, please. I would just point out um, that last paragraph, I know you mean it to read negatively. It reads very positively to me. <laughs> um, and I know you're talking about bringing the benefits in line with those that are recognizable by other Vermonters. But then you go on to frame it as um, what we all hope will happen with health care healthcare costs, right? Um, that we're, we're always looking to lower premium costs, out of pocket costs, et cetera, and understood that there's a trade off with taxpayers. And um, but I'll just note that that as you frame it, it's it's kind of a positive result. It seems. Or do you? Or do you but, um, it's uh, <clears throat> it is certainly different than what was available prior to the arbitrator's decision. Well, let me put it this way. Yeah. You, you say most school employees are better off under this award than in 2017. So the reverse would be most school employees are worse off under this award than in 2017. And I don't, I don't think that you would frame your desired outcome that way. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't follow that. So you're, the, the, the section is is headed concerns about the implications of the decision. Mm -hmm. And as a negative implication, you say most school employees are better off than they were in 2017. That, that seems to me a, a positive result of the, of the, uh, the triggers. If you took that, I mean, it's a long segment, yeah, but at, at the expense of the employer, um, or the folks that are paying the taxes in the local towns that, that are yeah. supporting I, these decisions. I, right? maybe, so, I, I mean, I think it's it, at the end of the day, it comes down to trying to strike the right balance here. I, I agree. I'm, I'm just, I guess, um, pointing out, I don't know who wrote this document, but if, if I were writing it, I wouldn't have framed it this way because it seems like what you're arguing is that most school employees should be worse off under this award, and I don't think that's what you really mean to say. It is not. Point, okay. Point noted. Good. Thank you. Um, so, as far as uh, requested additions, um, the BSB pressed the following changes to Act 11, which include the modifications suggested by the employer commissioners and a few additional changes identified by the BSBA. These changes should be incorporated into S226 in order to clarify Act 11 and improve the process. Um, first, under covered employees. Um, amend 16 BSA 21012 to clarify that school employee includes all employees of public schools who meet the eligibility threshold established by the statewide benefit. The current language does not include supervisory, confidential, and certified employees such as business managers, food service directors, and certified therapists. And this has caused confusion about whether these employees' benefits fall within the licensed teachers and administrators or the municipal employees. Um, secondly, employee representation. Um, we would like to amend 16 BSA 2102 B2A not to read. Um, four members appointed by the labor organization representing <coughs> the greatest number of teachers, administrators, and municipal, employee, mu and municipal employees in this state, provided that at least one of the members shall be a licensed administrator. Uh, the current language states that licensed administrators are covered um, under school employees but it doesn't provide for their representation on that commission. Well, they could be, right? It's just not mandated. Correct. Yeah. Um, regarding alternates, um, we'd like to clarify that commission alternates uh, should not be permitted unless <laughs> both parties agree to include them in the ground rules for the negotiation. Question. Yes. So um, to, to be blunt, I, I thought that 
NEA um, started off on a bad foot with bringing so many people into the room. I thought that muddied the waters, it created friction unnecessarily. A basic point they had, I thought was well taken, which is that as with a jury or with an understudy of a Broadway show, you want to have a replacement or two up on what's happened. So is it the idea that there were five alternates in the room, or would school boards object to having one or two alternates? Uh, I don't know that there would necessarily. Uh, so I'm not one of the commissioners. I don't yeah. know whether, what or not, whether or not they would find that favorable. But I think at the very least, they would like the ability to establish that in the ground rules. Yeah. You know, those those five additional folks showed up with no, you know, advanced notice right. or or even consideration by the employer bargainers. Yeah. Okay. So um, so you'd prefer that that be a bargain rule. Um, yeah. At least at least let's have it in the ground rules, right? Yes. Okay. Um, under commission, uh, we would like to strike the provisions D, F, and H of uh, 16 BSA 2102. Um, D states that members of the commission may be removed only for cause, and that the commission shall adopt rules pursuant to 3 BSA chapter 25 to define the basis and process for removal. Um, since commissioners are appointed for a six-year term, which is pretty lengthy, it is important for the appointing bodies to have the ability to remove a member who's just not meeting expectations cause is a pretty strict uh, bar to, to meet. Yeah, so you mean s school boards being able to remove their representatives from NEA? Correct. Got it. Yeah. Um, F states that commission members shall be entitled to receive per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses pursuant to 32 BSA 1010. Um, this entitlement wasn't funded by the legislature, um, thereby burdening BSBA. Um, with the cost, uh, if the legislature is not um, interested in funding the entitlement, then, then we feel that it should be removed. Um, and then H states that the commission may adopt rules or procedures or both pursuant to 3 VSA Chapter 25 as needed to carry out its duties. Um, we feel that the language is unnecessary in the case of this commission which exists for the purpose of collective bargaining, a state <coughs> benefit. It's my understanding 3 BSA um, 25 applies to agencies of the government, so I would consider the commission to be separate from that. And, and I don't think um, you know, giving the body the ability to adopt rules to carry out their duties would be appropriate. Um, moving on to scope of bargaining, um, we would like to amend 16 BSA 2103 uh, by inserting a provision that would require the commission to negotiate a grievance procedure for statewide benefit, as well as cash in lieu of health insurance. Uh, Act 11 does not contain a mechanism for resolving grievances relating to the interpretation and enforcement of its resulting award or agreement. Potentially conflicting interpretations arising from district by district grievance decisions should be precluded to avoid confusion. Um, also, Act 11 does not explicitly set forth cash in lieu of health insurance as within the duties of the commission. There was disagreement about whether or not the commission could address this topic. Clarifying the statute would allow the commission to negotiate cash in lieu of health insurance, uh, which we feel is an important topic to address on a statewide basis when a statewide benefit is being provided. Moving on to timing. Um, we would like to amend 16 BSA 2104A1 to indicate that negotiations shall commence no later than October 15th of the year before the process is required to conclude and amend 16 BSA 2105B3A to require the arbitrator to hold a hearing prior to August 15th in the year before the agreement is set to expire and then modify other dates in the act to conform with this timeline. Um, it, what we found is concluding this process in mid-December is really too late for board members to uh, effectively work on budgets um, and get our work done. Uh, the timing just, it, it was really not good. So when um, you say require the ar arbitrator to hold a hearing, you mean the arbitrator that worked on, on the previous contract, on, on the, the contract that's in force? Uh, or no, or do you mean once the, the next round of so if the next round of negotiations goes to arbitration, 
Okay. Right. We would like that because this time the, the arbitrator's hearing was so late in the year that by the time the decision finally came out, you know, boards were pretty much all the way through the budgeting process, and we didn't have time to, <coughs> to react then to the to the cost implications of the agreement. So essentially, we'd like to do is sort of move the whole process up. Yeah. So it gives board members time to incorporate the the cost items into their budgets. I, I think the other benefit too is that. Um, it gives the, the tax commissioner the ability to fold those costs into the December 1st tax letter. Mm -hmm. So I look around and notice we've lost our form. Um, I knew that Corey wasn't going to be here. Or Jim. Didn't know that Jim was gone this morning in a doctor's appointment. Uh, and Ruth is in institutions, I believe. So we can we can continue on. Just we can't um, vote on anything. Yeah, we can't do any official action, but continue the testimony. Thank you. Um, regarding the arbitration panel composition, we would like to amend 16 VSA uh, 2104A3B2 to require that if the parties cannot agree on an arbitrator, a panel will be created which shall be constituted as follows. Uh, one panelist selected by the employer commissioners who is a Vermont resident but is not an employer consultant of the Vermont School Boards Association one panelist selected by the employee commissioners, who is a Vermont resident but is not an employer consultant for the Vermont NEA or AFSCME, and an arbitrator appointed by the American Arbitration Association. I have, so, I have to say, this one strikes me as odd, um, because if they can't agree on an arbitrator, mm -hmm. it's set up here so that an arbitrator will appoint the arbitrator. No, this panel no, 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 no. instead want, of an arbitrator. Yeah, so this, so the current statute allows that if the parties can't agree on an arbitrator that they get the, the, the panel is formed. We're recommending that the composition of that panel. What, what is it currently? I believe it's an arbitrator selected by the employee bargainers and an arbitrator selected by the employer bargainers and then a third arbitrator selected by the AAA. I see, so instead of three arbitrators, Picking the arbitrator, we here only have one arbitrator. No, so in correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the current statute yeah. allows the employee commissioners to select an arbitrator, and then the employer commissioners to select an arbitrator, and then and then the third one I believe is selected by the American Arbitration Association. Right, but but that's what I mean is, and it, it, if it's in the statute now, I take responsibility for it. <laughs> It seems somewhat absurd to, if we can't agree on an arbitrator, to then have three arbitrators agree on an arbitrator. Uh, although in this scenario, um, one would consider these panelists, I guess, and not necessarily. I think the important aspect of this is that they be employees, uh, be residents of the state of Vermont. Um, I think it's important that we have folks that are on the panel that understand the conditions in our state, and to have an arbitrator come from you know, somewhere out in the Midwest with, you know, little to no knowledge of Vermont um, is probably, is not in our best interest that we ought to have folks um, that are in tune with, with the issues and the, and the, and Well, the, so, and again, it's a little confusing, but to make okay. sure I understand. Yep. So we're saying if the parties can't agree on an arbitrator, this panel would be formed, two, two of the arbitrators would be Vermont residents who are on the, this panel, panelists. And then the other one would be not necessarily a Vermont uh, resident. I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's set up so that C, the arbitrator appointed by the American Arbitration Association, seems likely to essentially pick the arbitrator because the other two are going to disagree. And so that person is set up as the swing vote, the, the arbitrator of this dispute. So doesn't really accomplish what you want in that the arbitrator who's going to make the decision practically isn't a Vermont resident still. Does that make sense? Well, it does, but I think what it, I mean, I think that there are various ways that you could, um, what we don't address here is the procedure of, of how that panel would operate. And I think that there are a couple of sort of <laughs> commonly um, uh, used scenarios where the, the panelists could be part of the hearing. Um, could provide input, but it's still the arbitrator at the end that makes that final decision. 
the panelists could, you know, not be part of the hearing, but provide um, input based on what they've, you know, observed throughout the negotiations. Um, but I think the difference here is uh, the panel concept exists in current Understood. statute. I think so, the only change, as I'm reading it here, is that we would like them to, to be, be a Vermont office. resident. Yeah, I, I got it. The, the, when we talked about this before, I think the concern was that Vermont had such a small pool um, of, of arbitrators. Um, and maybe this is where we might not be, I, I'm not, I don't think that we're recommending that these Vermont residents must be licensed arbitrators. Mm. Uh, okay. they're, they're panelists, I guess, in, in this scenario. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Sure. Um, regarding arbitration process, um, amend 16 VSA 2105, um, be as follows. The representatives of school employees and the representatives of school employers shall so submit to the arbitrator or arbitrators their last best offer on all issues remaining in dispute prior to the arbitration hearing. The arbitrator or arbitrator shall select one of the last best offers submitted by the parties prior to the arbitration hearing in its entirety without amendment. The parties shall not be permitted to modify their last best offers post hearing which is the scenario that we ran into yeah. on this round. Yeah. I think, yeah, that uh, was not good for us. I tend to uh, think that makes sense. I'm curious to hear what NEA says about it, but, mm -hmm. okay. Um, next, in reaching a decision, the arbitrator or arbitrators shall give weight to the evidence, documents, written material, and arguments presented, as well as the following factors. The actuarial value of the health benefits for the full term of the award proposed by each party as compared to health plans available through Vermont Health Connect and the percentage increase in education spending that is likely to occur under either party's proposal for the full term of the award as compared to overall economic growth for the state of Vermont. The arbitrator or arbitrators shall issue their decision within 30 days after the hearing. <coughs> the decision shall include a full cost estimate for the full term of the award for each of the last best offers submitted by the parties and a full explication of the basis for the decision. The cost estimate shall include a breakdown of costs borne by employers and costs borne by employees. Um, Joe McNeil is very eloquent on his frustration with the arbitrator's report that there wasn't a great deal of detail. Mm -hmm. um, is this the attempt to hit that? Mm -hmm. Because it seems like the language could even be a little more, this makes it sound like he can just submit a series of figures, but it seemed like Joe, what Joe was talking about was figures, but also rational rationale for why he made his decision or she made her decision, which might not be made on the cost list. You know what I mean? Could be made on other factors. Um, it, it could be. We, we um, that being one maybe of several things, we, we want to try to get to a situation where we, we know that the arbitrator considered these yep. factors. Yeah, I guess when I, when I take B and C together, it, it would significantly, if I'm the arbitrator and I come in and I'm reading the statute, it would significantly change the focus to which of these saves the most money. Um, not that that would be the only consideration, but there would be a great deal more direction for that person to decide based on sheer, um, you know, the, the language about um, percentage increase in education spending along with um, full cost of the full, full term of the award. And I understand why school boards would want to include that emphasis. Um, but it would be balanced in the letter, I think, by language related to the, uh, the benefits to the employees' um, out-of-pocket costs, et cetera. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I think later on we, you know, current statute does note the items that the arbitrators shall give weight to when they make yeah. their decisions. So, I mean, I think those items are already there. But I, I mean, I will say that, I mean, uh, 
these, are, these items are important to board members. They're important to our communities as well. I, I don't want to downplay that at all. I mean, these, these are important matters. No, absolutely. It's just a question of what the arbitrator is presented with as the framework introduced by statute into the, the bargain. This is, this is how they should be looking at it. Um, so my, my first blush response to this is that it, it would, if I was an arbitrator, it would suggest to me that the legislature was also maybe most concerned with um, rise in education spending. So, yeah, I guess I would be hopeful that if you, I mean, we could pick out these two paragraphs, but if they're in the context of the full statute, yeah. then I think it, it yeah. holds different weight. Um, and then just in, in the process that recently concluded, the arbitrator permitted the parties to change their last best offers post-hearing, but did not require them to provide an economic analysis of their final offers. Um, the above change would ensure that the arbitrator has all of the evidence necessary to consider the factors set forth in, in 16 BSA 2105. I think that was part of the issue is that those modified last best offers, the, the economic analysis didn't apply because they were changed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, item number nine, under legislative intent, um, we would like to strike subsection A of H23 of Act 11. Um, it will be confusing for the next arbitrator to have this statement of legislative intent, which was intended to address the first round of statewide <coughs> bargaining for health benefits, um, guidance to the arbitrator should be what is currently set forth under 16 BSA 2105B3B. Um, subsection A of H23 of Act 11 states that in recognition of the existing disparities in health care benefits between different supervisory unions and school districts and between different categories of employees within the same supervisory unions and school district it is the intent of the General Assembly that the Commission on Public School Employee Health Benefits endeavor to transition school employees and school employers to a more equitable health care coverage statewide in a manner that is fair and practicable for all parties involved. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've done that, right? The, the first round of negotiations are now behind us. Um, so I, we would consider that that paragraph no longer applies, but um, 16 BSA 2105B3B does. It states, in reaching a decision, the arbitrator or arbitrators shall give weight to the evidence, documents, written material, and arguments presented, as well as the following factors, uh, interest and welfare of the public, the financial ability of the education fund, and school districts across the state to pay for the cost of health care benefits and coverage, comparisons of the health care benefits of school employees with the health care benefits of similar employees in the public and private sectors in Vermont, the average consumer prices for goods and services, commonly known as the cost of living, and prior and existing health care benefits and coverage for school employees. Um, regarding compensation for commissioners and commission expenses, um, we feel that the legislature should appropriate sufficient funds to cover the cost of, these, of this process, including but not limited to the cost of commissioners per diem and expenses, the fiscal analysis, mediator, fact finder, arbitrator, and attorney's fees, um, all of which are estimated to be about $175,000 for the, the SBA. And now it's um, split costs, right? Between uh, NEA and no, so my understanding, these costs were the costs that were borne by the VSBA. The split costs were for the, for the analysis that was done for both parties, for the commission as a whole. Oh, I see, I see. This was... Um, this was for the employer commissioners. So the VBSA paid for the arbitrator, for example, 100%. No, I just clarification. Was it the, I'm sorry, did you Did the BSBA pay 100% of the arbitrator's fees? No, the arbitrator and mediator, fact finder, those were split between the parties. Yeah, that's But what this I um, amount that's here is includes BSBA's portion. Portion. Yes. Right, but in the current uh, statute, it calls on them to split those, right? Not per diem, but, but uh, arbitrator, et cetera. Yes. Sorry, yes. Yes, okay. Um, I think we're not likely to be able to change that. Um, just from my discussion. 
discussions with Jane Kitchell. But I do know that Nicole Mays contacted me about her DMs. Um, and I did forward something to Jane Kitchell about that. And she seemed as though that was something that, that they were open to. Mm -hmm. So um, the 175000 which would become 350 with NEA's side, mm -hmm. I don't think the state would be liable to or likely to pick up. Understood. Mm -hmm. that we would like that. <laughs> it's a cost, and, yes. and, and our organization is relatively small. Yeah. So. Um, and then finally, feedback on uh, 226 as it was introduced. Um, in section one, uh, the VSBA is not opposed to the proposed change, which requires a school district that employs a member of the commission to grant the commission member time off to attend meetings. Um, but we do want to note that there are associated costs to the school district employers, um, you know, including and not limited to substitute pay to cover those teachers that are not you know, going to be at the school at that time. Um, so if the committee is considering this change, um, then we also think that equal consideration should be given to appropriating sufficient funds to cover the costs of the employer commissioners per diem and expenses. Um, in section two, uh, the VSBA does not support the proposed change, which would allow premium responsibility percentage for each plan to differ among participating employees based on the amount of the employee's salary. Uh, this change would add a new administrative burden to school districts, but furthermore, um, an employee's salary may not be an accurate indicator of an ability to pay. Section 3, uh, VSBA does not support the proposed change, which would impose strict timelines and reporting orders on school districts, um, especially in the middle of budget season, which for most of us is you know, late fall to um, February. There will be no need to impose the reporting requirements in this time period if the timeline change, as we set forth early in the document, um, is agreed to. And then finally, in section four, uh, VSBA does not support the proposed changes allowing the arbitrators to select the recommendations of the fact finder or select among the last best offers, which both discourage settlement and make the process less predictable. Rather, VSBA supports adding an arbitration panel as recommended in seven above. Having Vermonters on the panel will ensure that the reward reflects the best interests of Vermont. So maybe I was misunderstanding. Is it the, so, pan, the panel question again? Yeah, maybe I was. Can I? I wonder if I can that. take a look. Can we look at the existing statute and the uh, language there regarding the panel? I don't know if we have. Um, do you mean instead of having a single arbitrator, we would have a panel of three that would be the arbitrator? Similar to what's in the existing statute, our change, though, is that that panel of three, the two of them, the ones that were appointed by the employee commission, and the ones appointed by the employer commission be Vermont residents. Okay. So I think I understand. So is it fair to say that of the four sections of 2.6, will really support the first? Um, with the caveat that. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a cost to local schools to be able to allow those folks yeah. out of the building. And, you know, I, quite frankly, my job as a school board member is to ensure that I've got the best teachers in front of my kids every day. And um, this commission was a time intensive effort. Yeah. Um, and so that would have an impact on my local schools. Um, here you say if the committee's considering this change, we should also consider something to under expenses, you're including substitute pay? Because that's not typically how we think of expenses. Um, no, I think I'm considering in the, in the context of what we had proposed earlier in this document about the legislature covering per diem expenses. I see. Um, I have a very hard time seeing <coughs> the Appropriations Committee agreeing to anything except for the expenses. Um, certainly not substitute teacher costs or uh, mediator costs, arbitrator costs. Uh, I, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I feel that I know them well enough. If 
substitute pay was not at issue if the draft called for the, the state to pick up per diem and expenses alone as traditionally understood, mm -hmm. are you then um, in agreement with section one? I'd want to give that some consideration before okay. Okay. committing to that. All right, well, I, I appreciate that. Senator Perchley. On the section three on the timelines, mm -hmm. is the concern the time, the dates, like if the dates were different, would there be a chance that the SBA would support it? Or is it just the requirement that they submit the data at the problem? No, I think if, if so, if we're looking at a timeline that allows us to get all of this done in time for school board budgeting, then some of the dates previously are, are less of an issue for us because they don't fall within our typical budget That's cycle where, where we're really crunched for right. um, resources and our business managers are flat out trying to right. get budgets done. Mm -hmm. So for like, like you proposed, August yeah. or September. Yeah. The, uh, hi, Jeff Take Francis. No, I don't. To the contrary. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey Francis, Vermont Superintendent Association. Um, I corresponded with Senator Perchlick because the first thing I did when I was invited to testify was check in with him with regard to provisions of 226 to understand the basis for the provisions. Yeah. And the reason that I did that as was the theme in um, Neil O'Dell's testimony the principal parties of interest here are the um, employer commissioners as represented by VSBA in general and the employee commissioners as represented by the Vermont NEA in general. So in terms of the superintendents association, I wasn't sure how to formulate a perspective and may be wrong about this, but I think that if I gave any testimony in the lead up to the passage of this new collective bargaining construct, it was on a very, very limited basis because it was mostly the VSBA and Vermont NEA. Um, but nevertheless, I thought because I had the bill at hand, um, it would be useful to at least share some perspectives. Um, and I want to indicate that I have not had the benefit of conferring with VSA members about it, but what I will say is that when the current construct was enacted, I wouldn't say it was confusing to superintendents, but they recognized that they were in a role of supporting management at some level in the negotiations process while they were represented by the employee commissioners. So that was navigable because of the way the, um, the law rolled out, but it was something of a role change in terms of how superintendents and some other administrators participate in the collective bargaining process. So I just wanted to open with that. Um, the reason that I um, communicated with Senator Perchlick was because I thought it was a simple, no, relatively straightforward bill, six pages, four provisions, I think that the testimony from the VSBA indicates that there's actually more complexities to that. Um, and I understand and appreciate your comment that you'd like to get consensus on any changes as those changes are made, whether that is achievable or not, and whether or not that's conditional to moving the bill forward remains to be seen, but I respected the fact that you said that, if that is in fact what you said. With, with the caveat that as we did with Act 11, there was one issue that the, that the Education Committee thought was uh, crucial, right. and that was the rebalancing of DI. So we went ahead without consensus on that piece, but everything else had consensus. It might be that we take one of the SBA's items that the NEA can't agree to, and we move forward with that because it seems common sense. We can't agree with their with their view of it, or vice versa. We might move ahead with a, uh, an NEA proposal that seems not controversial to us, but that the VSBA has indicated. Sure, I understand that. Um, okay, so that's helpful, thank you. So given, the, given my ability to participate in this, I've, actually, I've focused really in three specific areas. So the first area that I was interested in had to do with the section in the provision two, which talked about premium responsibility percentages 
um, differing in order to reflect an employee's ability to pay. This is page three. Right. And when I asked Senator Perchlick about that, and I have not had a chance to circle back with him, I'm sorry he's not here, he sent me a confusing response. And I'll, let me read to you what he wrote back to me, and I'd do it whether he's here or not. He said, um, allocating premium and out-of-pocket payments based on the ability of the employee to pay. My understanding is that this was expressly allowed in the last negotiations, but not going forward. I wanted to allow this option to be considered in future negotiations as I thought it was a fair component of the prior negotiations. That's contrary to my recollection because I thought it was not allowed in the last negotiations. I think it is allowed. I, I think, Jim? Hector, back to the As I remember. So, so uh, Jeff Ann from Vermont VA, it actually, uh, under session law, it's permissible to have two different premium out-of-pocket expenses right. for uh, licensed employees and a different one for unlicensed employees. That stops after right. So only for the first round. contract, and that that was actually the the language around that was the last change that we made, so which was on the Cole Mace um, suggestion, uh, and, and it was meant to be a one-time thing, NEA, before we passed Act 11, indicated that they would like it to go forward. School boards indicated that they wanted it from the get-go to be one, one uniform thing. The compromise, I think, was to have it be two steps. Um, first contract was allowed, second contract <coughs> wasn't allowed. My memory's slightly different. Uh, okay. My memory, uh, is that it was the session law provision was an understanding and appreciation by all sides. Okay. That uh, there was a walk, the teachers, licensed personnel were much closer together yeah. versus the unlicensed folks. Their, their the disparity in what they had for health insurance and how they pay for it was very different across the board. So we needed to acknowledge that, and that's why we allowed for the separation. We came in last year seeking to, to do what we're doing now. Uh, Nicole said, it's too early, we, you know, we shouldn't make the changes, let's go yeah. through one round of, of bargaining. Um, and that's what we're back here, uh, mm -hmm. as we said we would be. So my thing is, my memory is, we understood the differences and just thought it was necessary to address that one, one time only in session law. Um, but, but there was no appreciation for what I, I will call income sensitivity going forward. It was all appreciation for the, the immediacy right. of the differences. But, but now here, there's an there's a acknowledged attempt to try to make it going forward. Yeah. So I'd say two things about that. The first thing I would say is, I, to the extent that I was privy to any of that, I've forgotten it. And I don't, I don't believe I was privy to any of it. <laughs> and secondly, the description that Jeff Fannin just gave in terms of the explanation, I would say is not consistent with the answer that I got from Senator Perchlick, okay. where he says, my understanding is that this was expressly allowed in the last negotiations, but not going forward. I think the potential for misunderstanding or confusion based on that rather complex explanation is not consistent with what even his understanding may be. So I think that would be worthwhile checking in on. Yeah. But let's assume that that was something that you wanted to pursue. And I think that if you did want to pursue it, I'd have two categories of interest. One is, should you pursue it? And secondly, if you were inclined to pursue it, I would make some preliminary points. And these are what I would say. One is that ability to pay has a variety of definitions or considerations that could extend from individual outcome to household outcome to individual participant circumstance to wealth versus income. So the reason that tax structures are complex is because you try to have um, tax structures that are, that are reflective of, for example, progressivity or some other basis and when you think about ability to pay, it's more than salary. I would say in nearly every case. Um, the other thing that I would say is that if you go down that road, it's important to keep in mind that um, folks, I think, will respond, particularly outside the 
No, within every employee compensation relationship, what I, I came up with my own term here, and the term is the law of desiring to remain whole. So if you, if you put premiums on a sliding scale, you'd see employees respond in terms of their own individual negotiations or contractual negotiations, trying to not suffer a economic um, disadvantage on the basis of that calculation, even if the premise was to make health insurance more affordable for those folks who were um, less well compensated, which may be a laudable goal. But I think in an, in an environment where we, have, where we have concerns about the cost of education, you would expect that if somebody's premium share increased when they did a salary negotiation, they'd be looking to make that up. I think that's just human nature, something that would need to be considered. Um, and then the third thing that I would suggest, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this in terms of my thought process from an inter administrator's perspective. So what occurred to me immediately is that most administrators are on a 260-day contract and many teachers are on a 190-day contract. Mm -hmm. So there's a multiplier differential. So if you consider 260 days versus 190 days, that multiplier is 1.36. So if you had a teacher who was earning $70,000 and you applied that multiplier, that salary would convert to 95000 so why do I say that? Not necessarily because I think there's a one-to-one -one comparison, but when you consider this as a matter of public policy, it is a factor that you need to think about because it's a factor that will be brought to the contractual salary negotiations for anybody who's affected by this. Mm -hmm. So it's a long-winded way of saying it's not as straightforward as saying salary is a reflection of ability to pay. Yeah. So that's the, that's the first, the, point I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make um, goes to the testimony of the VSBA um, and the first thing that I said, which is the VSBA's recommendation that one member of the employee representation um, be a licensed administrator. And I think that the, the usefulness of that consideration goes to the conversation we just had which is if there was going to be a negotiation around sliding scale premium payments, I think it would be fair to have an administrator informing the employee side of the conversation with regard to their perspective. And that would be reflective of the fact that folks would maintain as a class, I think, that administrators are generally higher compensated in terms of straight dollar amounts, even if you leave out that factor that I just talked about. So if we're going to get into that kind of negotiation, and perhaps even if we want are not, if there is a subset of the employees who are administrators, then it seems reasonable that one member of employee representation ought to be an administrator. So I, this, this is just an endorsement of that concept. So uh, I'm, I wasn't around when all of this suit was right made <laughs> but um i and i didn't realize until we started digging into it a couple weeks ago that administrators were actually included including superintendents right. are included in these um, um the, the the negotiations and uh I, I i find that odd in and of itself that superintendents are included because you know as a as a pre as a former school board member we negotiated the contract with our own superintendent, the school board and the superintendent, and that included his um, health insurance. And I find it odd that they would have it as part of this. And, and it also puts um, the superintendents in this awkward position of having to be both on both sides, mm -hmm. because in negotiations for salary back at the district level, then he or she is going to be working with the school board to negotiate salary after anyway I feel it seems to me like this structure is awkward for superintendents right. um, and I'm just wondering if in general you think that is true or or if you think this works um, you know I'm not, to be honest with you I've not thought about whether it works or not I, I've, I've actually derived a fair amount of pleasure and <laughs> gratification from the fact that I haven't been involved in this process the way they all have but I see your point I think that if that's a question that's going to get raised at any level, 
it is the proverbial, uh, you know, loose thread on a ball of yarn. Yeah. Because the minute you talk about superintendents, there's also legitimacy to talking about other central office administrators. Absolutely, you I understand see, You know that. what I mean? I understand that, but the superintendent is the one person where the school board themselves is actually negotiating with it. The I superintendent mean, serve, session, you know, doing the whole, yeah. like, do we I, want to keep this guy and how much do we pay? Right. <laughs> I agree. It's, it's awkward as set up. It seems to me that this proposal from VSBA really heightens the awkwardness. Yeah, exactly. Because it's saying that now you have to have that person beyond the bargaining team, and then they have two masters, um, and they're one of five. Um, so that, I, I could be 108 degrees wrong, but I would imagine NEA would have difficulty with this proposal for that reason, yeah. because superintendents and school boards tend to often <coughs> tend to work hand in hand, um, and you know, Evaluate the school board evaluates the superintendent gives salary raises, so it's you know yeah that, and that's a little tough to imagine. and I'm not sure where that I would have to yeah and I you know I I I'm not prepared today to give you you know a lot of uh, in depth thinking on it but I do appreciate the point and if you yeah. if you know I'm not sure where this is going to go but it, if you go down that road then it's going to beg longer conversation yeah I, I think it's fair to say we're going to produce a bill it right. be a very short bill right uh, <laughs> um, um, but you know I think you're right Senator Perch like, um, produced a, a compact version if you look at the SBAs they have a good deal more than what's in 226 right so but it will depend on how NEA feels about all of those proposals. Right. And then the, my third point is what I would refer to as my thin ice point. Um, and I often get out on thin ice and then wish I hadn't, but I always go there. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do it here. Um, and it has to do with the conversation, which I had not thought about at all with regard to the VSBA's suggestion around compensation for commissioners and commission expenses and the $175,000 in costs that they were contemplating. And I know a little bit about both organizations, the NEA and the VSBA. To the extent that the cost of operating the employer side of the commission is derived from VSBA's budget, I watched the controversy around VSBA in terms of some tough positions they took with former public policy in the state, mm -hmm. Act 46 and others. And um, I don't know that the relative catchment for the respective organizations, NEA and um, the School Board Association and their ability to generate revenues for these kinds of activities is evenly matched. I would, I would just leave you with that thought yeah. because you could probably do a comparison of the economic ability and stability of each association and come to different conclusions about their abilities to absorb costly elements of this activity. So I'm respectful of the Appropriations Committee's position on we don't want to put more operating money into this, but I think to the extent you want... Um, level ground with regard to how this is supposed to work moving forward. And a sustainable. That is, that is something you ought to think about. Point well taken. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. And so just to state the obvious, yeah. the SBA um, has indicated not a great deal of agreement with the 226 draft. I understand that. You've had very little time to look over a set of, a long set of proposals. So, know that you can come back. We'll have Mr. Odell back as well. But tell us whatever you want to tell us off the top of your head. What what things seem to you um, starters from the get-go and non-starters? Okay. So I have some written testimony that I'll okay. hand out now. Um, and uh, I think I sent the genie already, so maybe up on the website. Um, so first off, thank you very much for allowing me to speak to Senator Perchlick's bill, 226. Um, as you know, I'm Jeff Fannin from the uh, Vermont Indiana Executive Director. Uh, we have about 
13,000 members, uh, teachers, sports staff members, who work primarily in Vermont's public schools. Um, I think some histories of table setting might be good here. If we go back in time, and, and the chair was here, but I don't think anybody else was. Um, in 2017, the governor came out with a proposal to do statewide bargaining. He said it was uh, what we should do. The VSBA, the superintendents, all supported that at the time. Uh, we did not. Um, had some concerns about how it was rolled out. And in fact, um, we said at the time, it's not collective bargaining. You bargain with your employer, not with the state who is not your employer. And as well, the governor's proposal that VSBA and VSA supported was uh, it dictated the terms of the agreement right at the, st at the start. So there was no agreement from us on that. Um, however, during the second year of the biennium in 2018, uh, we thought that uh, we should relook at this, and we did. Um, and we worked through to come to Act 11, which actually passed in the special session, um, and uh, did work with Nicole Mace from VSBA on that. Uh, we did not have a un uniform agreement on all things. I know that Nicole and I went upstairs to talk about the timeline. We were very concerned about the timeline originally in the bill. We both agreed that that was way too tight. Uh, what's in there is now is essentially what we thought we could get and, and, uh, and live with and the, the committee was willing to live with and that's where we are now on the timeline. Uh, it is not perfect and in hindsight uh, I'm sure it could be improved. Um, so on that timeline thing maybe we do have, we're pretty close to agreement. Um, the, the commission is as it's formed, it's labor and management equally represented. Uh, and they were tasked with bargaining health insurance. Health insurance is complicated, very complicated. Um, so they started in earnest, um, and it ended up with going to an arbitrator in December, <coughs> excuse me, in November, the decision in December. Um, and now you can't bargain locally for health insurance, and that's off the table entirely, and that's probably a good thing. Um, we do support uh, these amendments in 226. Largely, they're what we sought last year. Had a conversation with Nicole at the time. She said, substantively, I may not disagree with all these or, or agree with all these, but I don't disagree with them either. My question and concern is, do we do it now before, before we've had a round of bargaining? That was her only real concern that she expressed to me. And so she said she took that position, and that carried the day. And we said we would come back, and here we are back with largely the same things we saw it last spring, no different, um, with some tweaks with understanding that we've gone through one round of bargaining. Um, it's true that the arbitrator did select our, the employee's position. Uh, but it's also true that many educators will experience this as a financial hit. It's, it, it, it's a give and take, um, and, and that's understood. And we understood that schools will feel it differently around the state, as will employees around the state. Act 11, when it passed, also <clears throat> required all educators, all school employees, to be in, to be covered by health insurance. And there were lots, hundreds, thousands, perhaps, school of school employees who were not covered by health insurance at all. So of course it was going to cost more money. Covering people for health insurance costs more money. <laughs> in addition, it required all tiers of coverage. So single, two-person, and family. And a lot of support staff didn't have that prior to the passage of Act 11. So again, it's going to cost money. So but we knew, both sides knew or should have known upon the passage of Act 11 that it was going to cost more money. It was by design going to cost more money, and it was by design going to call, cover more people in, and have, give them more health insurance. That is a good thing that the state, as a matter of public policy, we should applaud, uh, and I think we do. Um, so indeed, it's, it's really the cost of health care that's the problem. VHI's rates are going up this year 12.9%. Um, that's before the implement, you know, the, this thing is kicked in, if you will. This, it's not affecting anybody. The cost of health care is the issue here. Um, and that's the concern. Uh, so I'll just dig into some of the, the, the bill issues. Um, section 2 
would address the disparity in the, the educator's ability to pay. <clears throat> um, we, we do that in a lot of places around the state. Uh, we do it with Act 60, for example. We have income sensitized people. Two thirds of the people pay for their education expense, their tax, based on their ability to pay. Uh, so we do it now in Act 60. This, this would just apply that essentially to health insurance for school employees. There's a wide disparity between what um, a school custodian or some other support staff person is paid at $20,000 a year and a superintendent who makes $150,000 a year. I'm not knocking it, but they, that, there's no accounting for that. How, how about the Elder <coughs> Labor Relations Act? Um, is it, is it uh, in Stockholm that it's Selra or? It's not in Selra. But I will say this, it's found in other places in Vermont. And in fact, it's found in school districts currently in Vermont. Chit and East right now has income sensitivity. So it's done, it, and, it's, and it's dealt with, and it's, it's worked. No, I get that, and, and you know, UVM as has you it. say, there are, there are instances in other places. I was just wondering, since we're paralleling labor relations acts um, generally, <coughs> Jim, do you happen to know? Damien would know. I don't believe there are any other uh, state labor relations provisions that require income sensitivity okay. or ability to pay to okay. be for health insurance. So, uh, just to clarify, I think one thing that this statute, I believe, does that I believe deviates from Selra or Melra is that it prescribes explicitly that in successor agreements after the first agreement, every all employees covered shall pay the same amount. Got it. So Therefore, not bargaining. right in, in the others, right? Yeah. So, in the others, you know, it doesn't prohibit putting a proposal on the table that could fashion some other type of remedy. So, how would the two sides feel about that? Right, right now, it says that they shall be the same. You're arguing that it should explicitly allow for different. How about if we just made it subject to bargaining? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're see essentially seeking, is the ability to put that proposal on the table. Yeah. Right now, the way the law is written, uh, written we can't do that. Thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. uh, initial reaction is not in favor, but I can certainly take it back to membership and see uh, if there's some flexibility there. Yeah, I mean, I, I always think about it as you don't have to change your mind, but it's a chip that you now have um, if there's something else you want more. I do, I would anticipate an, an administrative, uh, more work administratively for yeah. multiple folks on multiple tiers on multiple premium shares. Yep. No, I, I think that's undeniable. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, certainly discussion on that front, um, but we think it's important to acknowledge that there's a wide difference between uh, folks who are earning salaries in a school and their ability to pay. And as, as Colin po correctly pointed out, this one is unique. This law is unique in that it, it says everybody shall pay the same amount going forward. Um, so maybe there's room for compromise there. Uh, section four of the bill would allow the arbitrator to call to do what we call fashion a remedy uh, and not force the arbitrator to select one party's last best offer over the others. Uh, um, instead, the bill would allow the arbitrator to select the fact finder's recommendation <clears throat> or select issue by issue the last best offer of either side to essentially get to uh, a place that um, makes the most sense and, and ensure that it's not, unre you know, that one side or the other's position is not unreasonable or unlikely to produce undesirable re results or have a long lasting negative impact on the party's collective bargaining relationship. So, Jeff, yep. I just wanted to ask about this because was until you just reread this that I actually think I understand. So this section on, maybe maybe this is more a question for Jim, but this lines 14 through 18. On an issue per issue basis, they would still have to select from the last best offer. So it could be like the NBA <coughs> position on uh, uh, co-pays oh, yeah. and the VSBA's position on uh, out-of-pocket expenses or something or whatever. Um, but it wouldn't, it couldn't be, it, but it could be pieces of each of them, but it would have to be from the last best offer, not from previous. Right. Right. Um, right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Which, so it, 
and, and, and not something for now. And how would they de determine what is uh, issue by issue? Is it clear that this is that there are sectionable issues? You know, I, I think mean? I think the parties uh, did make it very clear to the arbitrator that um, there were issues as they. I mean, it's out of pockets, right. premiums. Um, uh, Number of hours to work to be eligible so for it is, coverage. I mean, there were some distinct, very it's really distinct clear issues. That these are separable issues, not that you could take like a cafeteria from last best dish app. Best know, dish. The, <laughs> that last best offer. Well, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I mean, there, um, yes, it would be okay. issue by issue on the last best offer of each side okay. and not from left field. How's that? Just to play out what um, Senator Hardy's saying. Suppose one side in their last test offer forwarded an issue that they believe should be part of the final agreement that the other side did not agree should be, I, I don't know what it would be, yeah. um, but a lot of times in school board negotiations, one side is really concerned about, usually management, about the contract, and the other side is very concerned about um, salary benefits. So let's say you have the management side choosing some piece of the contract like, um, I know at UVM, intellectual property all of a sudden surfaced one year as right. management really wanted to acquire interests in intellectual property produced by faculty. And faculty never really agreed that that was on the table. Could, under this scenario we're talking about, could one side unilaterally include an issue that the other side had not agreed was even an issue, and could an arbitrator then put that in their final? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's. I yeah. mean, that's sort that's of what, what I was. So, like, is it clear that d there are five issues on both sides, and they're the same five issues, right. or is it you know maybe one side has seven issues and the other one has five issues and they're not the same? Right. Like <laughs> you have an arbitrator who happens to have an interest in intellectual property, and they say well, that should be in every agreement. And yeah. They, and they drop it in. Is that right? So you ask, could that? The answer is yes. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say, it, but I will tell you that the experience that we had just a few short months ago was that they started nailing down, they started working with the arbitrator uh, before the hearing. They, there was a lot of phone calls, teleconferences with the arbitrator, Joe McNeil and Suzanne Durmeyer, who testified here a, few, a week or two ago, whatever it was. Um, there were a lot of phone calls, a lot of nailing down the issues. Uh, so the answer to your question, could there? Yes. Would there be? I think uh, highly yeah. unlikely. Okay. Um, and then the question is, if you want to drop something in at the end. <clears throat> um, you have to be in one of the offices. Yeah, it would, it, but I mean, I yeah. think the, the scenario that they're painting, um, I think you go there at your peril, right? You've had multiple conference calls with an arbitrator, and at the last minute you want to drop something in. Yeah. I, I think you go there, it's, it's not an advice. I would not advise somebody to take that course of action. Yeah. But you um, couldn't drop it in. You couldn't, in, 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 assuming if, it's- The way the bill's written. If it's written as your last best offer, it could, it, what Senator, oh, the chair is saying is, if it's part of your last best offer, could you drop in something? And well, I guess- well, I, I guess one thing I, I don't like personally about this proposal is last best offer, both sides are clear, you know, it's this offer or that offer. And we don't want that one, and we want ours, and they want theirs and not, and not ours. It's relatively clear. Um, but each, off, uh, each offer is internally consistent with itself, right? So, you know, we've set it up so that my take on premium split goes along with my out-of-pocket. It's all internally consistent. What this allows the arbitrator to do is say, well, maybe you get an arbitrator who says, well, I want to satisfy both sides. So there's four issues. I'm going to go two and two. And those four, when brought together, don't really work. And neither side really likes the package. They're not going to have a chance to say no. So everybody's dissatisfied. I mean, in this in this world, right. path. So I think, the, I think the protection there, though, is it's limited to only when the arbitrator makes a determination that the last best offers are unreasonable and likely to produce undesirable results or have a long-lasting negative impact on the party's collective bargaining relationship. But that, that's, uh, you were here, but I was 
right. asking Jim about that earlier. That trigger seems to be so um, hair. Uh, well, hair no. so it's it's currently in seller. No, I, I get it. It's just um, it seems to me it's that. Low bar. In fact, your arbitrator said if he had the ability to, to mix and match. Correct. He would. Not, not the the arbitrator. Yeah. Alan McCausland, selected yeah. jointly selected by both sides. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. I just, I just want to make that I mean, point. You were in the sense of he was on the last the commissions, uh, on the last negotiation. The commissions um, arbitrary. Yeah. Yes. Um, he said he would have gone uh, mix and match if he could have. I, I just think that's what you would, if we made this change, that's what you would wind up with more often than not. Um, it, it just seems to me. Human nature being what it is, it's hard for me to believe that they wouldn't mix it. The one thing I, I, I can see your point there, and, and one thing re reading the second clause about or to have a long-lasting negative impact, I think that's even easier to come to that right. conclusion. But the first two, unreasonable and likely produce undesirable results. One thing, especially after the last arbitrator's lack of explanation, we'd want them to explain how they, why, what's unreasonable about them both, and what would the undesired results be. I think if we forced the arbitrator to really define their, or explain their thought process, then it's, it's less likely they would. Decide. And they're getting a fairly big payday. In, in return, they should produce a work product more elaborate than what we got out of this last one. Well. The law against lame arbitrator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that part of uh, the challenge faced by Alan McCausland was he was under a tight time frame. Yeah. Right? And so, I mean, he was, he was obligated by statute and had told the parties in advance, I'm going to get this thing done by the time frame you've, this law has set out for me. He was very well versed in the law, uh, had read it extensively. And so he kept true to that, but understanding that he was up against a hard deadline, I think he issued, uh, he did the analysis he, that he thought necessary to get the decision by the time required. I mean, I think that's, uh, he was up against that. Would you be opposed to uh, requiring the arbitrator to give more explanation of, of decisions? All, all of them, or specifically like this? And instead of them just saying they were unreasonable, saying they were unreasonable and with an explanation. I'm not, I'm not opposed to having the arbitrator explain his or her decision, and I think it's a good thing as a general matter, but the understanding that there are time frames yeah. that yeah. were really strict, and he was adhering to those statutory timelines. And so, um, and so we should adjust the timeline. I th certainly, you know, that maybe that's a, uh, that would give both sides some more time or something yeah. like that. I don't know that more time necessarily is necessary. I'll be honest with you, but. Um. Yeah, I just remember going over this at great length when we were doing this before. And um, yeah, this is, we, we agreed that it was better to have, because it would, one thing it would encourage both parties, last best offer to be a reasonable package that could be accepted. And I, I still think that. Yeah. No, I, I have to say that's my, my default position, and we're not all the way through the, <coughs> the argument on it. But, um, so, Jeff, uh, I'm wondering, this is a long proposal from the SBA. Yes. And I'm wondering if it wouldn't make more sense if, if you are willing, uh, you and Mr. O'Dell, um, Two sides are willing to sit down and see um, at this point what what can be agreed upon um, and come back to us. Uh, if you know, um, Mr. Odell was pretty clear that most everything in 226 he didn't like. It may be that you feel the same way about their suggestions. In in which case, I would have you both back in and encourage you both to be more flexible, to get more of what you want by giving more to the other side. So rather than do that, why don't we just cut to the chase and have the two of you, if you're, if you're willing to, or designees. Certainly willing to sit down with the BSBA. Yeah. Y'all are good at negotiation. Yeah, right? we can do this. Um, <laughs> does that 
sound just need an arbitrary <laughs> yes. to explain this to self. Okay. And then, you know, it may be that you come up with, I mean, right now I think you indicated possible agreement with one provision. Um, maybe you come back with three and any eight can go along with three of yours. That's, especially if they're things like timeline and, and uh, other kind of structural things, that would be very helpful. And then the committee can start from that point of agreement and maybe we do wind up with a thing or two that don't have both of you on board. Can I just add to that request that, yeah. and, and this for Jeff as well, because it's really gnawing at me, this whole superintendent thing, yeah. and what you all think of that from both sides and what you think of that, if you could think about it more. Because it's just, I get oh, into, really? it just seems covered weird by to the, me. <laughs> if, we, if we start pulling apart who's, who's bargaining, in other words, pulling the bargaining unit apart, it's going to okay. get up It's to, totally fair. It just yeah. seems odd to me that superintendents were included in this to yeah. begin with. They are management. So, so here, I may I respond to that? I mean, I think that's a, a fair point. They are management. And uh, so on VHI's board, VSBA appoints three members to the VHI board. In fact, they, they appointed three management folks, uh, a school business manager, who, since, who just recently resigned, I think, and two superintendents so v, represent VSBA on the VHI board. Certainly, VSBA could have appointed a superintendent or other administrator to this bargaining commission to represent management's position, if you will. There was no prohibition from that mm -hmm. in the law. They could have done it, and, and uh, maybe that's what they're seeking now. And you could have done it. We, we could have appointed anybody. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so what I said before was it seems to me what, what points up the awkwardness or doubles the awkwardness <coughs> is this proposal, actually, to make sure that there's somebody <coughs> in the incredibly awkward position of negotiating from that double, double mastery um, position. So, right, and so I mean, I, I think also um, Jeff said he wasn't. Jeff Francis said he was not involved in the bargaining, which is true. But his superintendents were very much. I mean, I, I heard things from superintendents um, about bargaining. They knew things that we didn't know uh, from their side, and so it, it, you know, people are people. Yeah. And uh, the superintendents were, in fact, involved in bargaining from the management's pers perspective and, and side of the equation, and that's okay. Uh, and I just think that, that that's where they probably should be, is on the management side yeah. of the ledger. It seems awkward to me. And I, I mean, for both sides, and I feel for superintendents being put in the awkward position and you guys being, and school board members being put in the awkward well, position. Well, actually, Jeff was having a great time. He wasn't doing it because I was staying out of it entirely. So we were sending we were sending out updates to our members, and we sent it also to the principals and superintendents. Yeah, so, I, just, I just want to weigh in Jay Nichols, Vermont Principals Association. You know, we don't have anybody on that committee there, and we're put in an awkward position just as much as superintendents are. Because we're yeah. on the management side, we're the ones that actually execute the contracts on a day-to-day -day basis for teachers. All of our members were teachers before, and I know principals do not feel well represented in it. So, and the whole thought of the sliding scale thing is a real thorn. Uh, we're having enough trouble getting people to apply for principalships and superintendencies. Every one of our members used to be or was a teacher at one point yeah. in time, so that's something that needs to be kept in mind. Yeah. Well, it's a good point. If we if we stipulated that uh, you had to have a uh, licensed administrator, exactly. it, it would be one or the other, um, or, or you know, assistant principal, principal. Yeah. Yeah. Out. There's yeah. a lot of other so, positions. Yeah. I'd like to make two last points, and, and I address it here and maybe more completely in my written testimony, but I do think that sections three and five are about data. Data is enormously important when we're talking about health insurance, and <clears throat> we just need it in a timely fashion so the parties can, can use it in a, in a manner that helps both sides. Nicole and I uh, sat down, we, we had a joint contract with, an, with a person to collect the data. Uh, the data came in in drips and drabs and in different formats, and, and uh, it wasn't satisfactory for anybody. Uh, so data collection is paramount. We have to know, you know what people have in order to bargain on their behalf, whether they're a superintendent or a custodian. It's really important, and it, it was, a, um, I think, a, a sore spot for both sides. And, and like I say, Nicole and I, we jointly contracted for a person to collect the data so that we wouldn't get any bias in that data. We wanted clean data um, for both sides, and 
I would say it was less than perfect, and that would be an understatement. And, uh, and lastly, I conclude with, just because we're bargaining at the statewide level for health insurance for school employees, it's not health healthcare reform. And that's really the issue we're talking about here, <laughs> the underlying issues. Healthcare is expensive and growing all the time. So, um, you know, I say to the VSBA and to the superintendents and the principals, welcome. We've been fighting for two decades or more for healthcare reform. Please join us. We need you at the table. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, we could be a force for good. There's a, a bill up in the uh, House Educa uh, Healthcare Committee about a prescription drug uh, uh, review board along the lines of what Maryland did. We need your support there, please. Um, prescription drugs, I heard it this morning, are a big driver for healthcare, and we need, we need some help there from more groups and more folks, and uh, welcome. Can I ask uh, the two of you next Thursday? Um, that gives you just seven days. Um, but could you come back next Thursday, the two of you, and um, give us uh, an update on what, what proposals you have in common or, or reluctantly agree to? <clears throat> um, I think so. It would have to be uh, on the early, right? I assume you're going to be on the floor at 1 ish. Yes, so 1 30. Yeah, or so. Uh, I could do that. Okay. Um, Mr. Adele, could you? Uh, I will need to check with my employer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, perfect. And even if, uh, even if both of you can't come, as long as you have uh, agreement and the understanding is that the other person is only going to present the areas of agreement, maybe Thursday would still work, or we could have, if, if I'm, I'm trying to move this bill along, so I hesitate to go beyond next Thursday. That gives you a week. If, if Thursday won't work, we can try to move you in maybe Wednesday or I can't do Friday. Tuesday or Wednesday, but I could do this Friday good. I, do Friday. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, because I, I think what you're anticipating is the real work happens between now and next Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that's, the, I think, probably as important to me as the meeting <coughs> is the work getting done yeah. in between now and then. So. I see, I see. Okay, well, let's all do what we can. And um, if you can agree on, uh, on a package, that's ideal. And that would leave us probably only a couple of issues that committee would then try to decide if we should go with one side's proposal without the other's agreement. Um, so, you know, you can tell from our discussions there were things on both sides that seemed to make evident good sense. Um, and if the other side doesn't see that, it doesn't mean we will go with a sensible proposal. Anything else? Yeah. Um, yeah I'm, I'm, I mean, it's specific to their, uh, I'm trying to understand, school boards have the ability to tax, which we don't, um, the compensation for commissioners and commission expenses. Um, so I, I... Yeah, but the school board's association doesn't have the ability to tax. But their members do. What are you suggesting that I, I don't, I don't, include it in the local school budgets? Th their membership fees to VSBA are, are included in their taxes. So, um, anyway. That they would increase their membership fees in order to pay for negotiations. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we. Well. Watch what we do. It's a, it's a, um, I think it's fair to say that both sides feel disadvantaged financially. Um, and both sides would like the state to pay. Right. Um, 